Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching and or listening to this episode of Ages of Empires, where we will be going through all the major world empires throughout history and covering a specific leader also from each empire. As well, at the end of covering each empire, leader, and then empire, and then leader, we will also have a comparison of the two leaders at the end in the style of Plutarch's Parallel Lives, also another series that I have created previously based on the book, Plutarch's Parallel Lives, and a common theme throughout the series that we've had. So we co create comparisons between the leaders from each empire and effectually learn more about the two empires. So I think this is a particularly fascinating empire, um, episode, pardon me, as we will be covering the Holy Roman Empire and the Great Seljuk Empire. So two very, very different empires, particularly for that reason. And from the Holy Roman Empire, we will be covering Emperor Otto the Great, or Otto the First the Great. And from the Great Seljuk Empire, we ha will have Sultan Alp Arsan, um, Arslan, pardon me. Um, these greats are not arbitrarily added. Otto was most commonly referred to with the title the Great. This is not my um, choice to get to him, so Sultan Alp Arslan is not necessarily known as the Great, whereas the Seljuk Empire also usually has the Great added to it, so it's kind of a sort of parallelism. I guess they're both sort of equal, but nonetheless, I point that out that I did not, it wasn't my discretion that added those greats. That is sort of the common, uh, the most common way these this person and this empire are referred to respectively. So without further ado, we will begin with the first empire. So the Holy Roman Empires. The Holy Roman Empire was a complex political entity that emerged in Central Europe during the Middle Ages and endured for over a millennium. So one of the largest lasting empires that we've covered so far, and we've covered quite a few so far. Its history is marked by significant events, transitions, and transformations, and shaped its that shaped its rise and eventual decline. So that's how we will stru be structuring all of the empires in this series. We will have the rise and the fall, sort of inspired originally by uh, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by Shearer on the history of the Third Reich, and then I think that's also based sort of at least or a play on words of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbon. Also, I'm on volume two now of that six-piece masterpiece, but nonetheless, so that's how we will track these, uh, to give it a sort of structure to each empire we will cover in sort of a parallelism. So we will look into its rise and fall. So for some additional background information, so the Holy Roman Empire, also known as the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, after 1512, 1512 CE, so that sometimes referred to as the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, for part of its history after 1512. Furthermore, it was a polity, it was a polity in Central and Western Europe, usually headed by the Holy Roman Emperor. It developed in the early Middle Ages and lasted for almost a thousand years until its dissolution in 1806 during the Napoleonic Wars. So that's so general trajectory. But to start with the rise of the Holy Roman Empire, so starting with the history of the Kingdom of the Franks. So we have previously covered the Kingdom of the Franks, an empire, but I just chose to separate them here. So also, if one is able to see the slide, the period technically of the Holy Roman Empire, as we'll be covering it, will be 962 as our start date. But the Kingdom of the Franks started in 800 CE, and it was sort of its predecessor, which we have covered, and I'm grateful if you have seen that episode or listened to. And so some history about the Kingdom of the Franks, not to be too, um, to be too um, repetitive here, if you have uh, followed that episode as well. Charlemagne and the Carolingian Empire, 800 AD. So it's also known as the Carolingian Empire, is the Kingdom of the Franks. So the origins of the Holy Roman, Roman, Roman Empire can be traced back to the crowning of Charlemagne, King of the Franks as Emperor of the Romans by Pope Leo III in the year 800. So that was a sort of a shift within the Kingdom of the Franks that brought this Holy Spirit, essentially, and that became later part of the Holy Roman Empire. This mark, this event marked the revival of the Western Roman Empire in Europe, albeit in a different form. So we've covered the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire. So a lot of parallels here. If one wants to have some continuity, one could hypothetically trace the Roman Empire to Western Roman Empire, then to the Kingdom of the Franks, potentially, and then potentially to the Holy Roman Empire. Some, some could hypothesize. As for the Treaty of Verun, which was signed in 843 CE, Common Era, following Charlemagne's death, the empire was divided among his grandsons. 
according to the Treaty of Verdun. So it was disolluted, so that we won't say the Holy Roman Empire was started with, with Charlemagne or, and the, the Pope Leo III naming him Holy Roman Empire because it dissolved after him amongst his children, and the Holy Roman Empire will form itself later, as we shall see. This division laid the groundwork for the eventual fragmentation of the empire into various territories and kingdoms. In Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville, he writes that one of the risks in the United States is the, laws, the lack of the laws of progenitor. So it's impossible to carry wealth across generations because one's wealth will be divided amongst their children. The laws of progenitor would give it to the eldest child. That's an easier way to retain aristocracies. Whereas in America, hypothetically, there is no aristocracy. Here we see the laws of progenitor did not hold true for the kingdom. So it was divided and inevitably the, the, their dynasty fell or ultimately declined after that point. As for the Ottoman, uh, the Ottonian dynasty in the 10th century, the Holy Roman Empire, as we recognize it, began to take shape under the rule of Otto I, who is the leader we'll be highlighting. So we also have a biography of Charlemagne previously, also known as Otto the Great. He consolidated power in Germany and Italy and was crowned Holy Roman Emperor in 962 by Pope John the 12th. So here we have a new Holy Roman Emperor quite many years later, about 162 years later, exactly forming the official Holy Roman Empire as we're covering it here and distinguishing it from the Kingdom of the Franks, which we've also covered. He consolidated power in Germany and Italy and was crowned Holy Roman Empire once again in 962. As for the investiture controversy in the 11th and 12th centuries, a major conflict emerged between the Holy Roman Empires and the popes over the appointment of bishops and churches. So inevitably, perhaps one of the ailments came from this religious component, the holy aspect from the popes and the appointments of bishops and church officials, known as the investiture controversy. This struggle for the control over ecclesiastical appointments led to the prolonged power struggle between the secular and religious authorities. So sort of the third estate perhaps, or some, and nonetheless internal strife as we see here as a common theme, or sometimes the leading cause of declines in many empires we cause, sometimes secondary cause to the external. But perhaps we can say maybe the leading cause, maybe at least the first cause we will discuss is this investiture controversy and difficulties, clashes between the secular and religious authorities. As for the peak of their power under the Hohenstaufen, Hohenstaufen, dynasty in the 12th and 13th centuries. So the reign of the Hohenstaufen dynasty, particularly under Frederick I, Barbarossa, or Barbarossa, and Frederick II saw the Holy Roman Empire reach its zenith of power and influence. Frederick I sought to assert imperial authority over Italy, while Frederick II was a patron of the arts and sciences but also faced opposition from the papacy. So once again, this clash between the religious and the secular, but nonetheless, this is the zenith, which is under Frederick I and Frederick II. The Frederick I also being known as Barbarossa, and also, once again, under the Hohenstaufen dynasty. But necessarily after the peak, we come to the decline and fragmentation. So starting with religious and political fragmentation, as one might have guessed, as we've alluded to. So the Holy Roman Empire faced numerous challenges throughout its existence, including conflicts with neighboring kingdoms, internal power struggles among nobles, and religious divisions. Notably, the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, a huge factor. Um, Protestant cannot be overstated. And the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 marked the end of the Thirty Years' War and recognized the de facto sovereignty of the numerous states within the empire, further weakening the central authority. But part of what the Protestant Reformation caused is a division between them and Rome and them and Italy. And perhaps there's this history of the continuity from Rome to the Holy Roman Empire, but this Protestant Reformation in some ways set caused a separance because the Rome, the Catholics are linked necessarily to Rome itself. So, and as we shall see, the, the, the capital had changed many times as well. And the, 30 year, so, and the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 marked the end of the Thirty Years' War and recognized the de facto sovereignty of numerous states within the empire, further weakening the central authority. So fragmentation between states, so not just this clash between Rome and necessarily the Holy Roman Empire, 
but also many states within the Holy Empire, the Roman Empire as well, caused division. Ultimately, the Napoleonic Wars and Dissolution. So the final blow to the Holy Roman Empire came with the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte in, 16, in 1806, pardon me, 1806, following his victories over the imperial forces, Napoleon forced Emperor Francis II to dissolve the empire, effectively ending the thousand years of its history, or over, perhaps over a thousand, depending on where we want to continue its start date, but slightly less than a thousand, using this the chronology we're using. Napoleon forced, and this was Francis II, he forced to dissolve the empire. Francis II abdicated the title Holy Roman Empire and proclaimed himself Emperor of, um, Emperor of Austria, making the transition from the Holy Roman Empire to the Austrian Empire as well, so as a subordinate state in some ways, but also this is after the time of Napoleon and his conquest. Thus, though the Holy Roman Empire ceased to exist at this time, its legacy continued to influence European politics and culture, shaping the future development of the continent. And some say there are continuities with perhaps the Third Reich or even the European Union today. The Holy Roman Empire perhaps could be seen as a predecessor of the European Union itself, and nonetheless very informative for any study of European politics or any global politics more broadly as well modern in terms of modern times. So to cover a specific leader, Otto, Emperor Otto I, the, the Great. So the most important ruler, perhaps, of the Holy Roman Empire is often considered to be Emperor Otto I, also known as Otto the Great. His reign marked a crucial period in the consolidation and expansion of the empire, shaping up its political structure and setting the stage for its future development. Therefore, we seek to find history or a biography of his life. So for some background information, so he's born... Otto I on the 23rd of November, 912 CE, making him a Scorpio, I believe. Could be a Sagittarius, I'm not certain. Um, uh, and dying in the 7th of May, in 973 CE. Traditionally known as Otto the Great, or in German, Otto der Gross, I believe. Or, uh, and in Italian, Otto il Grand, or... Uh, Otto of Saxony, also referred to, uh, was an East Frankish king from 936 and a Holy Roman Empire from 962 until his death in 973, essentially starting the Holy Roman Empire itself. His eldest, he, um, he was the eldest son of Henry the Fowler and Matilda Ringelheim. So we shall see that at least his um, challenge in terms of succession was less conflicted than others being the eldest. So as for his early life and rise to power, Otto I was born once again on November 23rd, 912 CE in Saxony, Germany. Also, that's why he's also considered sometimes Otto of Saxony, the son of Henry of Fowler. I wonder if there's a connection between Saxony and later the Anglo-Saxons, the Germanic tribes who came up to England. I would think so. Um, son of Henry the Fowler, Duke of Saxony, and Matilda Ringelheim. He received a comprehensive education, coming from a very powerful and wealthy family, a son of a duke, of course, including training in military, tactics, diplomacy, and governance, preparing him for the future role, rule, role as a ruler. So, but ultimately, kind of gives us a feel for the times he was growing up that he was gaining military education even coming from the aristocracy so even the aristocracy to some degree were heavily involved in the military Otto became Duke of Saxony succeeding his father upon his father's death in 936 CE and swiftly asserted his authority over the region consolidating power and expanding his influence as for his coronation of empire, uh, as emperor, officially starting the Holy Roman Empire, emperor, empire that Charlemagne had endeavored to create. So in 936 CE, following the death of King Henry I, Otto was elected king of Germany by the German nobility and established the Ottonian dynasty. So first he also became king, which is a significant achievement. Reading Blackstone's commentaries of the laws of England, it's fascinating the different ways that one can gain the title or the, the hereditary title of the monarch and in this case he was elected king of german and as we shall see it has a unique governance because it's an elective monarchy so therefore it's not necessarily hereditary which has its pros and cons which is also discussed in blackstone's commentaries of the laws of england 
As for Otto's reign as king was characterized by his efforts to centralize authority and assert control over the various duchies or regions ruled by dukes and principalities within the realm. In 940-51 CE, Otto intervened in Italy in response to a plea for assistance from Pope Agapetus II, leading to his coronation as Emperor of the Romans by Pope John XII in 962 CE. So this had not been done against, well, it was originally done by Charlemagne, and then there's a large gap, but at 962, the King of Germany is crowned by the Pope John XII as Emperor of the Romans, so therefore unifying the Romans, essentially, and the Holy Roman Empire, forming the Holy Roman Empire itself, or forming, um, unifying Germany with it, pardon me, or even giving Germany, uh, the King of Germany, power over the Holy Roman Empire and Emperor of the Romans. This coronation marked the revival of the title of Holy Roman Empire and signaled Otto's claim to imperial authority over the territories of the former Carolingian Empire, but we've distinguished them here. Military campaigns and expansion after this time, Otto I embarked on numerous military campaigns to expound the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire and assert his authority over neighboring territories. He waged wars against the Slavic tribes in the east, including the Magyars, who would later become the Hungarians, and the Czechs, consolidating German control over the region and establishing the eastern frontier of the empire. So as we see, Germans would later conquer these peoples at different periods, and this is one of the earlier cases where they did such, conquering the Magyars, the Hungarians later, and the Czechs, but distinctly um, different people at this point, distinct languages, and generally considered to be different even races, if one prescribes to those beliefs or or that nomenclature. Otto also intervened in Italy to suppress rebellions and insert his appear imperial authority over the Lombard kingdom, kingdom and papal states, securing the empire's influence over the Italian peninsula. So once he is crowned emperor of the Romans, he does really take up, fill the shoes, and he does exert his control over the regions in Italy, such as the Lombard Kingdom and the Papal States as well. So he really uses the power he's given by Pope John XII. As for his domestic policies and administration, Otto I implemented significant administrative reforms aimed at centralizing power and strengthening imperial authority. He established a system of royal officials known as counts to govern various regions of the empire and enforce imperial law. So one of the Alexis de Tocqueville in his On the Old Regime in the French Revolution remarks that one of the causes of the decline of the French monarchy was that they got rid of their buffer. They got rid of the aristocrats that were between them and the mob. Once they were gone, there was sort of they were overwhelmed, and in this case, sort of Otto did the opposite, and probably rightfully so, to create to create a centralized government is to create these um, these counts to, or regional leaders to control and to create assert centralized authority through giving leadership. So it's a sort of a trade off. They give them some authorities over regions, but through that responsibility, perhaps yields loyalty, at least to the one who gives it, as we've observed so far. Otto also fostered close ties with the church, appointing bishops and abbots loyal to the crown, so also exerting his powers into the church as well, so very, very um, sophisticated if the power were his primary objective, and supporting ecclesiastical reforms aimed at enhancing the church's role in governance, so even sort of giving a trade-off here by allowing them to have some control in governance, he also allows they give concessions and allow him to appoint certain individuals he wants in power and exert other authorities in other ways. As for Otto the Great's influence, Otto the Great's reign marked the peak of the Holy Roman Empire's power and influence. Well, no, pardon me, that was under Frederick the I and Frederick II, but some claim that perhaps that was one peak, solidifying its positions and preeminent political entity in Western Europe. But nonetheless, perhaps if he had been in Frederick I or Frederick II's shoes, maybe he would have outperformed them anyways. He was the one who, Otto I, Otto the Great, hence the name, was the one to form the empire and really exert control over such vast regions that had not formally been controlled by the king, the emperor of the Germans. His efforts to centralize authority cannot be overstated and establish strong imperial, gov imperial government laid the foundation for the future development of the empire that was ultimately destroyed by Napoleon Bonaparte, who we will discuss um, in very much detail in 
respect to his empire. Otto's legacy endured long after his death on the 7th of May in 973 CE. He is remembered as a wise and capable future um, ruler who brought stability and prosperity to his realm, earning him the epithet the Great and ensuring his place among the most significant figures in European history. That's for certain. So not everyone gets the title the Great only. A so small handful that we've covered. Fewer, I would say, probably three so far. And this is episode 45. So if anyone's counting, you know, we're watching these in order, but please feel free to watch them in any order that is according to your fascination. Reverse order is equally important. So that is Otto the First, the Great and the Holy Roman Empire. So as to the content of the slide, which so another other titles, the Holy Roman Empire of the German Nation, it was called in 1512. Um, they changed that name. It was revived in 962 from earlier the Kingdom of the Franks when Otto the First was crowned emperor by Pope John the Twelfth as Charlemagne's and the Carolingian Empire's successor and beginning the conti its continuous existence for over eight centuries. So very, very remarkable point in history, that um, coronation, essentially, of the um, of Otto I, the crowning by Pope John the Twelfth. As for a significant leader, Emperor Otto I, the Great Empire, Holy Roman Empire, period. So 800 was when Charlemagne was um, crowned emperor by Pope John the Twelfth, but the Holy Roman Empire officially started in 962 CE with the crowning of Otto I, and then lasted all the way until 1806 CE, so starting from the Middle Ages through the early modern era. The modern locations include Germany, of course, Austria, Switzerland, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Czech Republic, the Netherlands, Slovenia, France, and Poland, not called those places at, at the time, but those in the modern regions. Million square kilometers, 1.10. So actually not so um, about average. I think believe or even slightly smaller than average. I believe the average. I took a tally, and these are the largest empires, of course, that that we've covered in the series. The average is 1.17. So pretty close to average. But some, for example, the largest we've covered to date have been the Abbasid and the Umayyad Caliphate, which were tied for 11.1. Must be noted, though, however, like nomadic empires are much more are able to rule much larger regions, but that does not necessarily mean they're ruling over large populations. So as we shall see, the population here is quite large and larger than many other empires of similar size, 1.1%. Um, so this was a very populated region of the earth, ruling over sedentary people, and it's also worth going further in history too. Whereas ruling over a large swath of land when you're the only group with horses is much easier to do than when there's fortresses all around. Million square kilometers, 0.42. Percent of the world would be 0.81%, excluding Antarctica. Capital city, it was multi-central Rome, was the capital de jure, a legal capital according because of the, after the coronation by Pope John the Twelfth. Aiken was the capital um, in practice from 800 to 1562. Palermo was the de facto capital from 1942, to, oh, sorry, 1194 to 1254. Innsbruck was the capital from 1508 to 1519. Vienna, a beautiful city, which I've been very fortunate to visit, um, and I believe I've been to Innsbruck as well, um, was a uh, capital from the 1550s to 1583, and as well from 1612 to 1806. Frankfurt would be another beautiful city, was the capital in 1562 to, to 1806. Prague was the capital from 1583 to 1612. Re Regensburg was the capital uh, from 1592, 1594 pardon me, to 1806. And Witzler was the capital from 1689 to 1806 CE. Some capital moved many times for various, various reasons, but the point is the history was so long, inevitably it moved. Government was elective monarchy, as we noted, so it did not necessarily go through the to the hereditary descendant. It was elected, as we saw with the case with Otto I. His father was only the duke, not the king of the Germans. And it was also a mixed monarchy after the imperial reform. Common languages included German and medieval Latin, it was the administrative, liturgical, and ceremonial language. And there were also various other languages, for example, in the Czech Republic, for example, and other regions they conquered, Slovenia and the Magyars, for example. Religions were various official religions. However, Roman Catholicism was the predominant religion from 1054 to 1806, and necessarily through the reigns, through Otto I and through the Holy Roman Empire itself. 
But Lutherism after the Protestant Reformation in 1555 to 1806, and then Calvinism, which is another source from the Protestant Reformation as well, from 1648 to 1806 CE. Population was estimated to be 29 million at the year 1800 and 23 million in 1700. So those are actually quite large populations today, a little bit smaller than Canada or California or Tokyo today, I think close in size maybe to Mexico City. But nonetheless, that's much smaller than the population today, but technology has changed significantly. As for the images, so on the top left, we uh, I, I usually have the individual in the top left, but I thought this is very important to put in the top left, is the double-headed eagle with coats of arms of individual states, the symbol of the Holy Roman Empire. So I think it's fascinating. I'm recently getting into, into birds and falconry. I've never gone falcon hunting, but I'm fascinated in the concept of it. I'm just, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is into falcon hunting. Whether you agree with him or disagree with him personally, I won't say where I stand on that, but nonetheless, I admire his interest in falcons, and I do admire him as a person as well, but the fascinating thing about a falcon is the falcon comes back. It's the fascinating component. It does. It, it's a relationship. Every time it flies away, it could never come back. That's an option, but it trusts the human. So it's fascinating. But the double-breasted eagle is the fascinating um, source of the Holy Roman Empire, which also has implications. The eagle, for example, the United States, for example, even. An eagle was also the symbol of the Roman Empire as well, but the double-breasted sort of gets an evolution here. And the, it is a painting from uh, 1510, so this is furthermore interesting, known as the quater, uh, also known as the Quaternion, Quaternion Eagle, um, also, or the Imperial Eagle. But this one is interesting because it has all the uh, mint flags of the kingdoms within the Holy Roman Empire. So if you look, look you can see the small uh, duke, duc ducheries, or duchies, pardon me, or the regional counts, particularly. To the right of that, we have Innsbruck, beautiful city on the waters with canals, etc., and is, was the most important political center under Maximilian, and it was sent uh, it was the seat of the Hofkammer or the court treasury, and the court chancery as well, which functioned as the most influential body of the Maximilian government. So economy was very important in this time, and it was sort of maybe can be thought of in some ways like an Amsterdam, a sort of had significant water access which, which facilitated its trade. And it's, this is also a painting by Albrecht Dürer um, from 1496. Um, to the right of uh, that, um, of, uh, and it was commissioned under Maximilian I of the Holy Roman Empire, so it's actually a very, very old painting too, so very, very beautiful. Unfortunately, it could only be small here, my apologies. Uh, to the right of that, we have um, oh, pardon me, more information about Maximilian I. He was king of the Romans from 1486 and the Holy Roman Empire from 1508 until his death in 1519. And he, he was never crowned by the Pope, however, as the journey to Rome was blocked by the Venetians. So he proclaimed himself elected emperor in 1508, so a unique point in history. So maybe a point of law, perhaps, if one cannot get to the Holy Roman Empire to be crowned, he, one can claim it themselves by de facto. Um, in 1508, Pope Julius II later recognized this, however, so maybe it, was, um, it would not have held the test of time, but nonetheless it happened. So maybe a point of law that might have implications if there were any descendant states of the Holy Roman Empire, if one believes in this continuity. And it was also done at Trent. Um, this uh, later recognition, and thus breaking the long tradition of the papal coronation for the adoption of the imperial title, though. So broke this continuity, perhaps, sort of an uh, unsurper, perhaps even. In the 12th century, stained glass depiction of to the right of that of Otto the First. So there's our image of Otto the First, um, in from the Strasbourg Cathedral, beautiful city as well, Strasbourg. To the right of that, we have the Holy Roman Empire at. Uh, um, Oh, pardon me, that's the map. Um, to the right of that, we have Pope Julius um, uh, II. Or, oh, pardon me, we have, this is, I believe, yes, is Maximilian I to the right of that. Um, so uh, I put these two next to each other to see the, the differences and sort of style over time, how modernized it became and sort of similar as it moved perhaps even to the ports, sort of gets almost a low Germany, like a Netherlands-ish uh, style. Throughout, um, at least just through these two uh, emperors. As for additional information, we have it was preceded by East Francia, 
the Kingdom of Italy and the Carolingian Empire, as we mentioned and covered, and if succeeded by the Confederation of the Rhine, so the separation, the Austrian Empire, the Kingdom of Prussia, the old Swiss Confederacy, the Kingdom of Sardinia, the Duchy of Savoy, Dutch, the Dutch Republic, and the Kingdom of France. Um, some other information, Emperor Charlemagne was considered um, not necessarily the first of the Holy Roman Empire, but the first of the Carolingian dynasty and the first to be crowned a Holy Roman Emperor, from, who reigned from 800 to 814. Otto the first was the official of the first official Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor of Continuity, who reigned from 962 to 973. Charles V, another notable emperor, reigned from 1519 to 1556. And Francis II, who was the last emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, ruled, reigned from 1000. 792 to 1806. So the legislature is called, or was called, the Imperial Diet. The Some important events. Frankish Charlemagne is crowned Emperor of the Romans on the 25th of December, 800, as mentioned. The East Frankish Otto I is crowned Emperor of the Romans on the 2nd of February, 962. Conrad II assumes the crown of the Kingdom of Burgundy on the 2nd of February, 1033. Uh, the Peace of Augsburg is signed on the 25th of September, 1555. The Peace of Westphalia, a very important event, and in the Thirty Years' War, was signed on the 24th of October, 1048. The Cabinet Wars, 1648 1, 700 to 1789. The Battle of Austerlitz between, uh, with Napoleon on the 2nd of December, 1805. And the Abdication of Francis II on the 6th of August 1806. So very excited also to cover the Napoleonic Empire. So that is Emperor Otto I, the great, very great empire, emperor, at least in my own opinion, and according to the title ascribed to him, and the Holy Roman Empire, which is infinitely deep in terms of wisdom and own empires, but I hope we had good coverage here. But we will discuss it more indirectly in its comparison after covering the great Seljuk Empire and Sultan Aslan. So the Great Seljuk Emperor, Empire, also known as the Seljuk Empire, was a medieval Muslim state that emerged in the 11th century and played a significant role in the history of the Islamic world and the Middle East. Therefore, when we seek to find the history, once again, the same structure of its rise and fall, to see its parallels, perhaps. So the Seljuk Empire, of the, or the Great Seljuk Empire, was a high medieval, culturally Turco-Persian, so important note, culturally Turco-Persian, Sunni Muslim state, so not Shia, so we can try and um, create our parallels between our Sunni Muslim states and as well our Shia Muslim states, and established and ruled by Kinik from by the Kinik branch of the Oguz Turks. It spanned a total area of 3.9 million square kilometers, so making it over double the size of our average empire, or 1.5 million square miles, from Anatolia and the Levant in the west to the Hindu Kush in the east, and from Central Asia and the north to the, to the Persian Gulf in the south. So it was de facto also independent, but it was also, there was a, still a caliphate from the Abbasid dynasty that, the caliphate that should still be referenced. There's other smaller semi autonomous states, such as the Buddid, Buyid dynasty, that were also subordinate to the Abbasid caliphate, but nonetheless, this one, Great Seljuk Empire, is distinctly its own empire as it did assert absolute autonomy we do have to draw a sort of line here so the great Celtic empire was sufficiently autonomous to be considered an empire hence the name and nonetheless it was also very large but not not as large as for example the Abbasid or the, the Umayyad caliphate as well which were at 11.1 I believe million square kilometers tied for the seventh largest empires of all time however so as for the rise of the great Seljuk Empire, so the origins of the Seljuk Turks. So the Seljuk Turks were a nomadic Turkic people. So maybe that's one of the reasons why they were all able to rule over large regions of land, being of nomadic descent and, or, or nomadic military capacities as well, who originated from the steppes of Central Asia. In the 10th century, they migrated westward to Persia and were gradually where they gradually converted to Sunni Islam. So they sort of adopted Islam, but they were not they so it came to it so it makes them quite unique as well in that respect as for their cell or from other empires which were sort of claimed direct ascendancy from prophet muhammad for example the fatimid caliphate or the abbasid caliphate or the maya caliphate so as for the seljuk conquests so the seljuks rose to prominence under the leadership of turgil beg 
who became the first sultan of the Seljuk Empire in 1037. So that officially marks our start. So after you know, asserting of the autonomy, Tugil, Tur, Tughill Beg and his successors embarked on a series of military campaigns, conquering vast territories across the Middle East and Asia Minor. So the fact that it was able to assert its own military force is an evidence of autonomy, but not sufficient. One could still be a subordinate state and exert military force and not be autonomous. As for the famous Battle of Manzikert in 1071, one of the most significant events in the rise of the Seljuk Empire was the Battle of Manzikert, where the Seljuk Sultan Arp Aslan, who we will cover, or Alp Arslan, defeated the Byzantine Empire. So a huge achievement, cannot be overstated, the defeat of the Byzantine Empire ultimately ending officially, or there's some say continuity to the Frank, to the Kingdom of the Carolingians or the Kingdom of the Franks, but nonetheless, the end of the Eastern Roman Empire, formerly called, was done by the Great Seljuk Empire. So, significant achievement, finally ending that history of well, Eastern and Western Roman Empire by ending the Eastern Roman Empire, which lasted longer. As for the, Sel the establishment of the Seljuk Sultanate, so the Seljuks established their capital in Baghdad and expanded their empire to include parts of Persia, Mesopotamia, Syria, and Central Asia. So very enterprising, perhaps was part of their nomadic spirit. They adopted the title of Sultan and ruled as powerful overlords, often allowing local rulers to govern semi-autonomously under their autonomy. So as we've seen, a source of power for a lot of empires is allowing for some regional leaders to exert some autonomy because large, two large areas of land are perhaps impossible to rule. As for its zenith of power, or its peak, which necessarily, as we should, will have to fall, the cultural and intellectual flourishing. So the Seljuk Empire witnessed a period of cultural and intellectual flourishing with the patronage of scholars, poets, and artists. The Seljuks played a crucial role in the transmission of knowledge and from the Islamic world to the West, so important contribution, particularly during the Islamic Golden Age. As for architectural achievements, the Seljuks were renowned for their architectural achievements, notably the construction of mosques, madrasas, and caravanserais. Examples include the Great Mosque of Isfahan and the Seljuk caravanserai of the Sultan Han in Turkey. So very beautiful structures, one of which we have here on the slide, as we shall discuss. But I always note that architecture is sort of the epitome once one has the foundation, once one has all the agriculture, all the food, they can support large structures and sort of moving into the three-dimensional. But also there's a book, The Fountainhead, it's sort of the, the, the protagonist, Rourke, I believe is his last name, is he is allowed to be creative in his architecture because he's mastered the foundations, the basements, the plumbing, etc., the mathematics. So, so after that, so, but unfortunately, even after this great architectural and great achievements and bringing of Islamic world to the West, their decline and fragmentation came, starting with its internal strife. So the Seljuk Empire faced internal strife and power struggles among rival factions within the ruling family, leading to fragmentation and weakened central authority. So very common symptom of many of the greatest empires even. The Mon As for Mongol invasions, however, which many other empires were subjected to, in the 13th century, the Seljuk Empire faced invasions from the Mongol Empire under Genghis Khan, a very great emperor we shall cover, who uh, was maybe one of the early inspirations for my interest in, in empires, as there's a book by Khan Igledun called Wolf of the Plains, where he covers uh, Genghis Khan, and it's a great story that got me interested in empires and sort of the history of people also and their rises to power. But nonetheless, there were a lot of Kaganates and lots of Khans before Genghis Khan that we've covered and I did not know of when I was younger. But nonetheless, Genghis Khan was the one to defeat the great Seljuk Empire, as we shall, and we shall cover him and his empire soon. The Mongols conquered then Persia and devastated much of the Seljuk territories, further weakening the empire. As for its division, the division of Anatolia. Following the Mongol invasions, the Seljuk Empire fragmented into smaller states, including the Sultanate of Rum in Anatolia, so ultimately a, 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 a separation. This division paved the way for the emergence of the Ottoman Empire, as we shall cover as well, a very important empire that's traced some of its roots, at least from the Seljuk Empire, which eventually would conquer the remnants of the Seljuk territories in Anatolia, so it would eventually be subsumed by the Ottoman Empire, a very important one we shall cover soon. 
So as for the end of the great Seljuk Empire, by the mid-14th century, the Seljuk Empire had disintegrated entirely, with its former territories following under the control of various Turkic, Persian, and Mongol dynasties. The legacy of the great Seljuk Empire endured in its cultural and architectural achievements, some many of which still exist today in the region, as well as its influence on subsequent Muslim empires, such as the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East. So very, very important empire that we could not neglect. So as for the specific leader to highlight, Sultan Al-Arslan. So the most important ruler, perhaps, of the great Seljuk Empire is often considered Sultan Al-Arslan, whose reign marked a significant period of expansion and consolidation of the Seljuk Empire. Therefore, we will seek to find a history or a biography of his life. So for some background information, Al-Arslan, born Muhammad bin Dawood Chagri, Chagri, was the second sultan of the Seljuk Empire and great grandson of Seljuk, the eponymous founder of the dynasty. So, sort of the greatest lineage one could have claimed to the throne or claimed to power within the region. He greatly expanded Seljuk territory and consolidated his power, defeating rivals in the south and northwest. And his victory over the Byzantines at the Battle of Manzikert in 1071 ushered the Turkmen settlement of Anatolia and marked a critical point in history, marking the end of the long-lasting Byzantine Empire, the successor of the Roman Empire itself, which was the successor of the Roman Republic, which was the successor of the Roman Kingdom, all of which we covered in separate episodes, which I'm grateful or hope you have um, seen or listened to. So as for Alp Arslan was born in 1029 CE in the Seljuk capital of Rey, located in present-day Iran. He was the son of Chagri Beg, one of the founders of the Seljuk dynasty. He, Alp Arslan received a comprehensive education, including training in military tactics, so similar as we have seen to many other leaders, such as Otto I, coming from this royal lineage, but nonetheless still gaining military training is evidence of the, of the times. Governance training as well, and hinting at his likelihood of ascendance to the throne, gaining that governance training or at least some significant power, and Islamic jurisprudence preparing him for a future role as sultan, so he was expected to come to power. As for his military campaigns and conquests, Al Arslan ascended to the throne of the Great Seljuk Empire in 1063 CE following the death of his father, Tughil Brat Beg. He inherited a vast empire stretching from Central Asia to Anatolia. One of Alp Arslan's most famous significant campaigns was the conquest of Anatolia, which is in modern-day Turkey. In, in 1071, he led his forces to a victory of the Byzantine Empire at the Battle of Mezikert, resulting in the annexation of Anatolia into the Seljuk Empire, so claiming a much larger region also for his empire, but also ending the history of the great Byzantine Empire. As for the Battle of the Mezikert, is considered a turning point in the history of the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world as it paved the way for the Seljuk expansion in Asia Minor. Necessarily, the Byzantine Empire was Christian after Constantine, as we have covered, and I'm grateful if you have seen and or listened to that episode. As for administration and governance, as Sultan Al-Arslan implemented administrative reforms aimed at centralizing and strengthening Seljuk authority over the diverse territories of the empire. He established provincial governors, so a very common theme amongst many of the most successful leaders is to create provincial governors to sort of lead through delegation, known as atabegs, to administer over various regions under the Seljuk control and maintain stability. Alp Arslan also fostered close ties with the ulama, or Islamic scholars, and promoted the spread of Sunni Islam throughout the empire. So also promoted of religion, which is not necessarily true of all leaders. As for his diplomacy and foreign relations, Alp Arslan pursued a foreign policy of diplomacy and alliances to consolidate. So not only was he great with the sword in terms of defeating the Byzantine Empire, but also knew how to engage in diplomacy and alliances to consolidate the Seljuk power and secure the empire's borders. He maintained as well friendly relations with the Muslim states, such as the Abbasid Caliphate and the Fatimid Caliphate. We have covered both of those who also engaged in the diplomatic negotiations with the Byzantine Empire and other Christian powers. So also knew when to fight and when to create alliances and who to deal with and who not to deal with, perhaps. So as for his legacy and influence, Sultan Alp Arslan 
reign marked one of the zeniths of the great Seljuk and perhaps the greatest zenith of, of their power and influence. His military victories and administrative reforms contributed to the empire's expansion and stability. Alp Arslan's conquest of Anatolia laid the foundation for the Seljuk presence in the region and influenced the subsequent history of the Middle East. He is remembered as a skilled military leader, defeating the Byzantines a just ruler and patron of Islamic, Islamic culture and learning. His le legacy endured long after his death in 1072 CE, shaping the course of the Seljuk history and leaving an indelible mark on the Islamic world. So that is Sul Sultan Al, Al Arslan and the Great Seljuk Empire. It was also known as the High Medieval Culturally moving to the content of the slide, also known as the High Medieval Culturally Turco-Persian Sunni Muslim Empire also known as it was established and ruled by the Kinnik branch of the Oghuz Turks from Anatolia and the Levant in the west to and, and they ruled from Anatolia and the Levant in the west to Hindo Kush in the east and from Central Asia in the north to the Persian Gulf to the south so those are the large region that we covered it's double the size of many of the empires we've covered as for significant leader Sultan Alp Arslan empire the great Seljuk empire period 1037 to 1194 CE, known as the High Medieval Period. Modern locations include Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Million square kilometers, 3.9%, very large, our average is about 1.7. Million square miles equivalent would be 1.51. Percent of the world, 2.89%. That's a very large region, excluding Antarctica. But it must be noted these people were uh, nomadic, so a larger region. The population is perhaps even less than the, the Holy Roman Empire we've covered, but the region was smaller than even the greatest extent of the Holy Roman Empire, which this empire we have paired with. The capitals include Nish Nishapur from 1037 to 1043, Ray 1043 to 1051, Isfahan from 1051 to 1118, Mur from 1118 to 1053 for the eastern portion, and Hamadan 1118 to 1194 for the western portion. So many different capitals, should indication of its um, uh, many of the various important events that happened throughout its history, but also as we can see the division between the East and the West around in 1118 CE. Once again, to clarify also there's um, in some ways because they have this Turkic connection, they have sort of the uh, Kaganate um, influence within this Islamic Caliphate influence. So from uh, so they're also very nomadic, ruling over a large region of land necessarily, but not as sedentary, despite also, however, creating great architecture. So sort of a very nuanced empire, sort of combining some of the previous empires we've covered, such as some of our Kaganates and some of our Islamic empires, particularly our Sunni Islamic empires. But at the same time, its population was a little bit smaller at tens of millions. As the common languages were Persian was the official, or also the lingua franca, the common language, and the court language, the language of erudition, um, of education, and literature. Oghuz Turkic was the dynastic and military language, so the royal family came from Turkic origin, despite most of the people and in court, etc., using Persian. And Arabic was the language of theology, law, and science, which created a connection with the caliphates as well. The religion was Sunni Islam, also known as Hanafi, one of the four major sects, and the population was tens of millions, so maybe smaller perhaps, or maybe larger than the, than the Holy Roman Empire, but still a larger region, not within the top ten of all time, but still large region, smaller than the Abbasid or Umayyad Caliphate, for example. But nonetheless, as for the images, in the top left we have the, um, the, the symbol of the great Seljuk Empire. Um, to the, below that, we have the ruins of Marv, one of the capitals of the great Seljuk Empire. And we can see some of its beautiful um, architecture in Merv. To the right of that, we have Turk Turco man soldiers from the Book of Antipodes and oh, Antidotes of the Pseudo Galen. It was probably produced in northern Iraq or in Mosul in the mid 13th century. You can kind of see maybe some of their military uniforms, see these pointed hats, perhaps. And it looks like then we can also see that on horseback, nomadic as well, or at least having cavalry capacities in war. To the right of that, we have a miniature from Majma al Tawarik by Hafiz Abru, circa 1025, which depicts the ascension of the throne of Alp Arslan. So that is our Alp Arslan, you can see here, with a goatee and a nice sort of pointed, pointed crown as well. 
to the right of that, we have a Celtic celestial globe with a stand. So those shows their sophistication of the stars in the sky. You turn the globe and you can see all the stars in the sky. It's significant, something that's so unfortunately, I believe, um, people don't get to see the stars as much anymore. At least I cannot see the stars very often. And uh, which depicts the and that is regrettably so. And uh, and it was produced in one thousand one. 1,144 or 1,145, uh, pardon me, yes, uh, and, and it exists in the Louvre Museum. I've been there, but I did not see it there at the time, but I endeavored to go back and see it. And the globe mentions this globe includes all the stars mentioned in the Book of Almagest. After modifying them in proportion to the interval between the calculation of Ptolemy and the year 540, so a reference to Ptolemy, a great leader of thought we've covered it in our history of leaders of thought series and produced this um that was written in 1144 but in their chronology 540 a h and it says it is the work of sanat yunus or al hasaib al astrolabi in the year of 539 which is equivalent of 1144 or 1145 so very cool piece of item also connecting some of our series here where we see parallels between our history of leaders of thoughts but Ptolemy influencing as well our empires and our military conquests etc additional information some significant caliphs al Qaim from 1031 to 1075 al-Nasir from 1080 to 1225 the Sultan was Turgil was the first one from 1037 to 1063 and Turgil the third was the last from 1174 to 1194. History the formation under Tughil Tug Tug pardon me in 1037 the Battle of Dandanagan was in 1040, pardon me for my pronunciation, the Battle of Manzikert ending the Byzantine Empire was in 1071, the First Crusade was in 1095 to 1099, the Battle of Katwan was in 1141, the supplantation by the Khwarezmian Empire was in 1194, so it's important to also note this overlaps with the First Crusade, which will also be highlighting in more specific detail. And, and we'll see cross-references as well, how, how that interacted with the Celtic Empire. As for the map, we can see the large, um, re we can see this large region, the 3.9 million square kilometers, and we can see the other neighboring empires. We've covered the Fatimid Caliphate, we discussed the Sultanate of Rum, the uh, Pechenegs, we, Pechenegs, we have not covered as much, but the Kievan Roofs, we've seen interact with the Pechenegs, and as well the Kievan Roofs is an empire we previously covered. The Kumans, uh, uh, another nomadic peoples, Georgia, the Karkanid, Kaganate, the Gazvanid Empire, another empire we've covered, the Western Chulakias, we've covered it there, or indirectly, and the Cholas as well, the Pala Empire, Kocha, the Kyrgyz, the Kimeks, the Kitan Empire, another empire we've covered, the Shishia, uh, the Song Dynasty, another empire, important empire we've covered. The Goryeo, the famous Korean Empire. Jurchen, the Pagan, Kumar, and the Malayu. So important, a lot of interactions here. I think a beautiful map to see many of the sort of the landscape of many of these places we covered. So as for additional, it was preceded by the Okuz Yabgu state. It was preceded also by the Gazvanids, the Buyid Dynasty, the Byzantine Empire, the Kakuyids, the Fatimid Caliphate, the Karakanid. Ka Khanate and the Marwanids and the Rawadids. It was succeeded by the Sultanate of Rum, the Anatolian Beyliks, the Gurid dynasty, the Khwarezmian Empire, the Atabegs of Azerbaijan, the Sulgurids, the Bavandids, the Ayyubid dynasty, the Burid dynasty, the Zenid dynasty, the Danish Mens, the Artukid dynasty, the Sharmens, the Shah Hadids, the Kerman Seljuk Sultanate, and the Kingdom of Cyprus. So my apologies for my pronunciation. Many of these we'll cover indirectly, and I endeavor to be better at my pronunciation when we cover them in more specific detail. But nonetheless, this large region was ultimately succumbed to many different regions, and eventually its influence would ultimately see, be seen as in the Ottoman Empire in, in, in certain ways, as we shall see another important empire we'll cover. But next we shall move to the comparison between Otto, Emperor Otto I, the Great, and Sultan Alp Arslan. So once again, not to be partial towards Otto I, the Great, he was given necessarily that title. His official Wikipedia page, for example, is Otto I, the Great, but um, at the same time, the Seljuk Empire has the title Great put in front of it. So at least there's some 
fairness here. But nonetheless, that's why there's not a parallelism here on the slide. So Emperor Otto I of the Holy Roman Empire and Sultan Alt Arslan of the Great Seljuk Empire. So comparisons and contrasts. So Emperor Otto I of the Holy Roman Empire and Sultan Alp Arslan of the Great Seljuk Empire were both influential rulers in their respective realms during the medieval period. While they came from different cultural regions, religious backgrounds, they shared certain similarities in their leadership styles and achievements. Therefore, we seek to find their similarities and differences, so both sides. So, so for some similarities, their military prowess. Both Otto I and Alp Arslan were renowned for their military prowess and strategic acumen. They led successful military campaigns and extended their territories of their empires through conquest. So significant military leaders, perhaps self Arslan maybe has the one singular greatest achievement of defeating the Byzantine Empire, but Otto I the Great was also the first of his empire and also has the title the Great, so maybe generally maybe the better lead, uh, military conqueror, but specifically maybe self Arslan had the more single uh, pivotal event, but maybe Otto I the Great's actual existence as becoming the first Holy Roman Emperor of the, the, the official Holy Roman Empire as existed, maybe is also more significant as well. Also another similarity is their centralization of power. Both rulers sought to centralize power within their empires by implementing administrative reforms and establishing a strong centralized government. They also appointed regional uh, semi uh, well, leaders with autonomy to sort of exert their authority, but also be reliant on them as well. Otto also supported the Christianization of territories under his rule, while Arslan fostered the spread of Sunni Islam. So they also both used the state religion to assert authority. Interestingly enough, Otto I the Great was not from Rome. Sultan Arp Arslan was not was from Turkic descent, allegedly, and not necessarily Arabic descent. So both of them sort of were sort of came to the religion, but both of them used them. So very similar there as well. As further on their religious patronage, Otto I and Alp Arslan were patrons of religion and promoted the spread of their respective faiths within their empire, perhaps both for political reasons and for their own uh, beliefs. Otto supported the Christianization of territories under his rule, while Alp Arslan fostered the spread of Sunni Islam. Cultural and intellectual patronage, another similarity. Both rulers were patron patrons of culture and learning, despite being great you know, military leaders objectively, supporting the arts, literature, and architecture within their empires. They contributed to the cultural and intellectual flourishing of their realms during their reigns. As for some differences, their cultural background. Otto I was a Christian ruler of Germanic descent, while Arp Aslan was a Muslim ruler of Turkic descent. So both of them have very different backgrounds, but also maybe similar in their both of their relative divergence from their religions. They came from different cultural and religious backgrounds, which influenced their governance and interactions with neighboring states. But nonetheless, these, although their differences with respect to their relative religions are even their, their original descents are still different and the religions are still different as well. As for their geographic focus, Otto the First Realm, the Holy Roman Empire, was centered in Central Europe, as we know, encompassing modern-day Germany, Italy, parts of France, and parts of France, and other Czech Republic, etc., Slovenia, Magyar, Hungary. Hungary. In contrast, Alp Arslan's Great Seljuk Empire was located in the Middle East, encompassing Persia, Anatolia, and parts of Central Asia, as well to the Levant, etc. So different regions, which necessarily have different dynamics. For example, in in the Great Seljuk Empire, there were more nomadic peoples, whereas in Europe, there were more sedentary peoples. As for religious context, not to say one is more educated or not, for example, there's Ptolemy under the Great Seljuk Empire. So, as for religious context, while both rulers promoted their respective religions, they faced different religious contexts within their empires. Otto I contended with the power and influence of the Catholic Church, so uh, sometimes clashed with the secular or or the religious authorities against the secular authorities in Europe, while Aslan navigated the complexities of the Sunni Islam and interactions with the other Islamic states, noting he's from Turkic descent. So perhaps there were occasionally clashes, but not maybe not to the degree as explained or explicitly mentioned with Otto I the Great. But Otto I the Great ultimately got the greatest achievement one could have got, or the greatest ascent, by becoming king uh, emperor of the Romans. So maybe his relationship with the uh, Ro the Roman Church was stronger than Sultan Arp Aslan's relationship with the Caliphates uh, and uh, Islam. As for legacy and impact, 
Otto the First's legacy endured within the Holy Roman Empire and the broader history of Europe, influencing the development of medieval Europe and the formation of the modern nation states. So very important. Some say um, the Third Reich is connected to it. Some say the, the European Union is even the Fourth Reich. So maybe there's a descendants, maybe there's no continuity at all, maybe there's absolute continuity, but I think it's maybe somewhere in between. At least there's some influence somehow. Al Arslan's legacy also was felt primarily in the Islamic world, where his conquests and governance left a lasting impact on the history of culture in the Middle East, for example, through the Ottoman Empire. We can see continuity there as well, but also different because they're different places, different empires, and still very different, but we can see similarities in their trajectories. So thus, while Emperor Otto I and Sultan Art Aslan shared certain similarities in their leadership styles and achievements, military conquests and patrons of the arts and relationship with religion, they also differed in terms of their cultural backgrounds, geographic focus, for example. Emperor Otto I the Great was sort of the first Holy Roman Empire, so his father was only a duke, whereas Sultan Aslan was, came from the most powerful lineage within the great Seljuk Empire. Their geographic focus, too, was different, their religious context were different, and as were their legacies. But, however, there's parallels within their legacies and perhaps their continuities to modern times. And despite these differences, both rulers played significant roles in shaping the history of their respective empires and leaving a lasting impact in their respective wakes. So, that is Emperor Otto I of the Holy Roman Empire and Sultan Alp Arslan of the Great Seljuk Empire. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ages of Empire. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. This is Cashcroft TV. And I'd be very grateful if you continue to support. And I'm very grateful for your support here. Thank you so much.